Good morning. Good morning, Lord Church. Oh, come on. Good morning. I'm so happy to see all of you people. It's been, uh, what, two weeks? That's, that's a long time to go without the Lord's Church. So we're delighted, or I'm delighted to be back. And the reason Steve is in here is we overslept, and I could only get one of us ready. So I said, since I'm preaching, it better be me. So he just said, okay. So he's good. Uh, but welcome to the Lord's Church. Are there any first-time visitors here? Oh, good. Stand up and tell us who you are. Michigan, okay. Thank you. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Any other first time people? Okay, down there someplace. Okay, over there someplace. Stand up, please. Oh, thank you. Anyone else? Well, welcome to the Lord's Church. We're delighted that all of you are here this morning and that we are healthy and able to worship on this day. Um, Pastor Patty and myself are getting back to our, our Bible study classes on Tuesday and Wednesday. Mine is Tuesday at 2 o'clock right now, but we have one person that would like to meet at 1 o'clock instead of 2, so we'll talk about that with that little group. But it's Disciple 1 uh, on this Tuesday at our house. Then Pastor Patty's will be on Wednesday, and it's at Gene Stedman's house instead of Linda Bent's. And they start at 9.30. All the Bible studies are on the back, so jump in and, and uh, join one of them. So. Today, we're going to have a prayer shot and prayer time for Kathy Harrington. She's having surgery Tuesday on Tuesday. So please stay afterwards and come forward and we'll lay hands on her and pray for her surgery. Now, Pastor Roy has something that he would like to say to us. Talking about Bible studies. Yeah. Roy Dorsey asked me to uh, tell those guys who have been coming to his Bible study that it will now be changing from Thursdays to Wednesday at 9.30 at his house at 1010 Eagle Drive. Uh, also, as you uh, have realized that uh, the pastors have decided that, that we try to go back to uh, to our communion when everybody walked up in line and, and walked around and sat down again. And uh, we decided, because of the situations going on around us, that we're going to go with the cups. And I'm sure you all got uh, one of these given to you. Uh, is there anyone who does not have a communion cup with them at the time? So, well, great. Everybody's, they did a good job in giving them out to you. I quickly want to go over... Uh, if you've not seen them before, you'll see a little cellophane on top. And under that cellophane is the wafer. Uh, and you take the cellophane, you rip that off, and you can take that wafer out. And after that, you'll be drinking the cup. And underneath is another tab, uh, which is like a cardboard tab. And pull that up and feel it back. And there is the juice inside. Now, someone asked me if this was wine, and I said, no, it is um, just a, a juice, okay? So um, don't be afraid. I didn't want anyone to have any problem with that. Okay, so hopefully you can handle that. Maybe you can just get it ready before we get the communion and you're ready to go. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Those cups aren't that easy to open up, so... It's a two-parter. Be patient when we get to communion, and, and it'll work out, I'm sure. Is there any other announcement that I might have forgotten? All right, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Almighty God, we are just um, 
here to praise you. We are here to worship you. We are here to stand on your holy ground. We just pray that you uh, give us your Holy Spirit, empower us to be your people, empower us to follow our model, Jesus, in everything we say and do. We thank you, Father. We thank you. Amen. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the court of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praises. Happy are those whose strength is in you, and whose heart are the highways to Zion. For the Lord God is a sun and shield, he bestows favor and honor. No good things does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O oh, Lord of hosts, happy, happy is, is everyone, everyone who, trusts who trusts in you. Dear Lord, as we partake of the communion today, let the Holy Spirit fill us and bring everlasting love in what we say and do. Amen. Amen. Our first song we're going to sing together, and if you're able to, please stand <laughs> with me as we come before our Lord today. Join me with the pastoral prayer this morning.
Our loving Father, Lord, we, we have more blessings than we can possibly count, Lord. Every day you make us mindful of your precious gifts. You have cared for us all, Lord, and you have served us, and we will give thanks every day and praise you to always today and let us share your blessings with others. Just as you first shared them with us, Lord. Lord, your holy word, your Bible, contains promises and we will trust them. We will use this Bible of yours as our guide and we will trust you, Lord, to speak to us through your Holy Spirit and through your holy word this day and forever. Lord, we think of those who are in arm's way this very moment, Lord. We thank, ask you to be with them and protect them, Lord. And there's so much trouble in our world sometimes, Lord, that it overwhelms us. And But we know we can look to you and we can read your word and we can pray without ceasing every moment, any moment during the day when we are ready to pray to you. Be with those in harm's way, Lord. Be with those uh, men and women who are on our streets protecting us all. Be with our governments in, locally and, and in our uh, main Washington um, place, Lord. Yes, Lord, we, we want to be your people. We want to be there when folks ask us about you. We want to be prepared. And so help us, Lord, that we know your word and we can speak and show how much we love you to not only to those strangers or neighbors, but to our family. And especially we always think of our grandchildren, Lord, that we want them to know you and love you as we do. And Lord, we are now going to ask your people to uh, shout out the names of loved ones, of children or any of their neighbours or friends who are in trouble, Lord. We, we listen to these names with you, Lord, right now. Yes, that's right, Lord. Yes, yes. You, you hear them, Lord. You hear them and you know them and you love them. Be with them. Whatever troubles they may, go, may be going through, lift their hearts, lift their spirits and lift them up towards you, Lord. Give healing where needed, Lord. Give, give joy where there's sorrow and be with them all, Lord. And you gave us that wonderful, that wonderful prayer that we'll never forget all of our lives. As we come before you and we say it together, Lord, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom is come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, Lord. Amen. 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 Holy Spirit. as we come together and sing glory to his name. to him. 
And this is the time in our service where we give our tithes and our offerings to our Lord. We give back to him what he has given to us. So the ushers will come forward at this time. Almighty God, we just ask special blessings on those who gave their funds to you to use for your work here in our community, in our state, and in the world. And just guide us as we distribute these funds, too, that we are wise in that distribution. We just thank you, Father, and in Jesus' name we pray always. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear. Now, Vince is here. Okay, Vince. It's his turn. Maybe he's not. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see T'was grace that taught my heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear hour I first believed. Through many danger, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grave had save thus far and grace will lead me home when 
and we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. One of my favorites. Definitely one of my favorites. Uh, this morning, I want to start by sharing a story about a member of my family, my oldest son. He was my tall, skinny kid, and now he's a tall, very heavy kid. But back then, he was tall and skinny. He loved basketball, just loved basketball. So he had a chance to try out for the high school team. This was very important to him, almost like his God. He didn't make the team. He was crushed. He was beside himself. He couldn't believe he couldn't make the team. So. He was about as down in the dumps as anybody I've ever seen. He failed. He felt he failed terribly. He just couldn't get it right. Now, do you remember of a time when you felt that way, where you failed? You failed terribly, and you were on the verge of tears. You tried very hard to do something, and it just didn't work. Have you ever wanted to throw in the towel? Have you ever wanted to say, oh, I give up? Have you ever felt defeated and wanted to take your dollies and go home? Or hit a punching bag? Because you felt you weren't good enough for whatever it was you were trying to do. You thought you had failed as a parent or as a spouse or as an employee. Now, most of us, if we're honest, we've experienced that at some point in our life, at least once, maybe more times than once. So I've got a story for you this morning, and it's a story of a fisherman named Simon Peter and his call to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, a call that was born in failure, frustration, in fear, and in faith. So... The title of this message is A No Fish Day, and it's taken from Luke 5, 1 to 11. Now, I want to set the scenery just a little bit for you. Jesus is on this hillside uh, at the Sea of Galilee, and the sea is kind of down here, and the hill is sloping behind him. And the acoustics are pretty darn good there. I was, I've been there. And you cannot believe that the people on this hill can actually hear somebody down on a lower level. But that was the, the, the scenery that was taking place. So one day, as Jesus was standing by the Sea of Galilee with the people crowding around him to listen to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats that were left there by fishermen. And they were washing their nets. They left their boats and they were now washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. He could actually sit all the way down there and teach the people up here. They could hear him. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in other boats to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and he said, Go away from me. Go away from me, Lord, 
I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up to shore, left everything, and followed him. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> now Luke tells us that Jesus was standing by the sea and a crowd gathered. They wanted to hear him. How they knew who he was and what he was going to be talking about, I have no idea. But they knew he had something good to say about God. So they gathered and it was so crowded that people began pressing in on Jesus almost forcing him into the water. And they got as close as possible so they could hear God's word. They knew Jesus had something important to say, and they didn't want to miss not one single word of it. As the crowds moved closer and closer to Jesus, Jesus noticed those boats in the water. And they were empty, and the fishing was done for the night, and the fishermen were washing their nets. They'd spent the whole night on the lake and caught absolutely nothing, nothing to show for their trouble. Now, we're not talking about fishing out here for recreation or fishing in the little pond behind our house. Fishing was their livelihood. They uh, depended on the fishing to feed their family. You better believe they were very discouraged and disgusted by their failed attempt to fish. Those of us who have been in sales, we know all about how discouraging it can be when sales are down. Sometimes customers just don't appear or they just don't want to buy. We don't have one customer. We have a no fish day and they had a no fish day. I don't care what profession we've been in, there are days that are a total bust. There are days when nothing goes right, where nothing we try works. Our good deeds didn't happen the way we wanted them to. We failed. We failed to do what Jesus had called us to do. Days when you want to go and run and hide, and there are definitely no fish days. Now, I've heard folks blame God for no fish days. And let's face it, you have to blame someone. It might just as well be God, right? He's a pretty convenient target. I've heard some people say, God is trying to teach me a lesson. Hmm. Teaching me a lesson on my no fish days? I'd agree with that. I think when we have no fish days, God is trying to teach us something. If we open our mind to listen and our ears to listen. Our lesson might be called today, have faith on no fish days. Yes, God is with us on our no fish days and God calls us to cast out our nets one more time. We need to believe that, can, that God can and does work miracles in our lives. The miracles though may not be about fish. God may just surprise us when we act in faith. Peter's statement to Jesus was, Okay, Jesus, I know this stuff. I'm the fisherman. You're the carpenter. I know how to fish. I'm the pro. And then I suspect Jesus saw something, or, or uh, Peter saw something in Jesus, and he decided to go ahead and put his nets back down. Okay, if you say so, I'll do it. So what was the point of the miracle of the fish? It was not to make Peter a better fisherman, but to help Peter have an encounter with God. An aha moment. Jesus' miracles have a twofold purpose. One is to encourage believers or to encourage Christians. And the other is to allow us to recognize Jesus as God. Rejection comes in many forms. The people in the synagogue 
rejected Jesus because they saw him as arrogant. Jesus said, I'm the one you're waiting for. I'm the Messiah. The religious leaders didn't like that. They saw him as arrogant. Today, Peter tries to reject God because he, Peter, he feels unworthy. I want to reject Jesus' teaching when it doesn't fit with my lifestyle or my own plans. Some reject Jesus just because, just because. It's been my experience that in those times of frustration and failure that I'm willing to try something new. No fish days aren't going to control me. Maybe it's because I've tried everything else and nothing seems to work that I listen to Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, I'll let down my nets. You're in charge. On 9-11, 9-11 happened, I don't know how many years ago, but anyhow, when 9-11 ha happened, two days after that, on 9-13, I was to lead my first medical mission team into Mexico. Um, and I was excited about that. I had a big team that was going with me, and, and we wanted to go down there and help care for the people. Well, 9-11 happened. There were no flights. It was difficult to find any kind of vehicles to rent, and, and people were scared to go. Most of the team said, you know, I have a family. I'm not going to go. Okay. Well, we couldn't find a way to get there anyhow. Well, one of the team members said, okay, I found one 14-seated van, and we could go and drive straight through. Now, this is from Toledo, Ohio to Texas. And we did that. My kids had a fit. Mom, we don't know what's going on down there. If the country's going to be attacked, what's going on? We don't want you to go. And my feeling was, no terrorist is going to tell me what to do. I'm going to go. It was a wonderful mission trip. Flags were flying all the way down the United States. A lot of uh, fellowship with, with folks. When we got there, we were welcomed and with open arms, even though it was 2 o'clock in the morning. And then we got up at 5 to get ready for our mission days. And after the mission days were over, I was asking the team of 14, who drove straight through in this horrible 14-passenger van, what they thought Jesus would say if he was there watching what we did. And one of them said, he would say, you've done good. Now go and do some more. And that's what Jesus was saying to Peter. You've done good. Go do some more. That's what he says to you and I. We've done good. Go do some more. We're not called to follow Jesus when everything is rosy and peachy keen. But in moments of frustration and fear and failure. Peter learned that lesson. God does not call people who think they can do it all or know it all. God calls people like you and I, people who have known failure. God wants to use us. Our recovery from difficult situations or our no fish days can be an encouragement to our brothers and sisters because we have experienced what they've gone through. Our understanding and compassion is God's way of using us to help our Christian family. When Peter finally listens to Jesus and lets down his nets, he has this amazing catch. Nets break, boats are sinking, other fishermen come to help, so many fish. At that moment, Peter's eyes are opened. He realizes he is face to face with Jesus, and he falls on his knees in shame. And instead of saying, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, he says, no, get away from me. I am not worthy. I am not worthy. Go away. I'm a sinful man. Many times, like we're like Peter. We get ashamed of what we've done or haven't done. And Peter is saying, Lord, if you really knew me, you wouldn't want to be around me. 
he had done some bad things and he was struggling with his sins and some of the stupid stuff he did. And like us, Peter is ashamed. Go away, Lord. I cannot tell you how many people have come to me as their pastor and said, I have done horrible things. If you knew what I'd done, you would not allow me to lead a Bible study class, do call to worship, sing. You wouldn't even want me to come to church. They're ashamed of their past. They said to me, Pastor Joe, you wouldn't want me here. You wouldn't even want me to attend every week. Peter's words are often like ours. Go away. Go away, Lord, for I am a sinful woman. Go away, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Now, there are three things, and they're going to be on PowerPoint, that you need to know, and I want you to pay attention. First of all, God is not going anywhere. This is his universe. He's not going away. Okay, you're sinful. I'm sinful. We're sinful. Guess what? God still wants us around. God still wants to use us. God loves us more than we will ever, ever know. God wants us to stop sinning. God wants us to lead better lives because it hurts us, it hurts our family, it hurts our friends. But God will never stop loving us. Nothing that you and I can ever do can separate us from the love of God. Secondly, Whatever you've done wrong, God has already forgiven you if you've asked, and now you need to forgive yourself and get on, get on with your life. And third, God uses sinful people like Simon Peter, like you, like me. God calls us to begin again and to put our failures behind, to put our frustrations behind, to put our fears behind, and to follow in faith. And it's in faith. I had no idea how we were going to get to Mexico. You do it in faith. You called us, you get us there. When we want to throw in the towel, God wants us to throw in our nets and be surprised by the abundance of God's love and mercy and forgiveness that he has for each and every one of us. Bottom line, Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of your shortcomings. Don't be afraid to try something new. God can and will use us. In fact, he needs us to fish for others, to use our sins and our shortcomings as bait. If somebody takes a look at what you have done that's been maybe not so good and says, well, how did you give that up? How did you stop doing that? And you can tell them only through the power of the Holy Spirit, only through my faith in Jesus Christ. That is a powerful witness. Don't be afraid to use your shortcomings in witnessing to others. When others have seen how God has worked in our lives, they will be willing to be caught in that net of God's love and mercy. Our call to discipleship is not called in our successes, but in our failures. Now, I want you to think about this. When we failed at something, what did we learn? How did we grow? Where did we feel God's presence? And how did we move on? Our moments of failure can be our turning points and our learning points. When we fail, when we fail, we can learn from that. We can turn away from that and go a different direction. How can we avoid a crisis in our lives? I suspect most of our crises are a result of, I want it my way, not God's way. Now, I'd like to continue my Rick story, my tall, skinny kid that loved to play basketball. There was a Catholic school in our community and they took the kids who didn't make the cut on the high school team and formed their own basketball team with these kids. Well, Rick was a little reluctant. Should I join? Should I not join? Whatever. Well, he finally did in the hopes that he'd be able to play. But not only did he play, he was darn good. And the high school coach saw him playing on the Catholic team 
and said, why isn't that kid on our team? Well, he didn't make the cut. Well, they got him on his, their team, on the high school team, and he went on to be one of the most valuable players, played center, made points, great team person. He persevered, he practiced, he practiced, he practiced. We need to read the scriptures, read the scriptures. We need to practice and practice our faith too. God does not want us to ever quit. Jesus calls us just as we are, warts and all, to a life of discipleship, to fish and to follow. I'm sorry I missed Sheriff Grady Judd last week, but I saw him on uh, Zoom. And he gives us Christians quite a responsibility. He says, you can make a difference in the world. Christians are to make a difference in the world. In your church, in your community, everywhere. Be kind to one another. Be kind to everybody out there. You don't have to love everybody out there. Be kind and be respectful. Be part of the solution. Don't be part of the problem. Love all people. Speak good statements to everyone. And as Judd's mom said, and probably your mom said, I know my mom did, if you can't see anything nice, don't see anything at all. Christians can make a difference. And it's our responsibility to do so. So try again. Let down your net for our Lord and Savior. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, we just come to you always in praise and thanksgiving. You've blessed us in so many ways. And we know sometimes we fail you out of ignorance. Um, we just don't know any better. And sometimes we fail you when we know better. But we know that you love us so much. You have so much grace and mercy for each and every one of us. Help us to be like Peter, try again, and go out and answer that discipleship call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I begin this reading, please know that all who have accepted the, Jesus as their Lord and Savior are welcome at this table. And Pastor Roy already explained how to use a cup, so I'll let you know when to do it. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. And Jesus Christ, your word, became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and our death, and you destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and you poured out upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with, Jesus, with death, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples. Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup when the supper was over and he gave thanks to you and gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this. Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this, and as often as you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us. Before we come to the table, let us take a moment to pray silently to our Lord, confessing our sins. Let us pray.
in our Father's great love and mercy, you are forgiven. We are forgiven. Now, Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on these gifts, that in the breaking of bread and drinking of a wine, we may know the presence of your living Christ as we feast at your table. Through Christ, with Christ, and Christ, in unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours forever. Even though we are many in this room, when we take, when we break this bread and take of the bread, we are one in the body with Jesus Christ. We are one. We are unified. We are Christians. They will know we are Christians by our love. We are Christians. And when we drink from this cup, that too unifies us as the body of Christ. So now I ask that you take that top layer off and take the wafer out. Take and eat. This is the body of Christ that has been broken for you. And as often as you do this, remember, remember what I did for you. Take the next layer off and drink of the cup. And as often as you do this, remember, remember what I did for you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave us this most holy sacrament, this time of knowing that we are shedding in the body and the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for this feast. We thank you for your love, for loving us, even though there are times we're not lovable. You've made us perfect for just a moment through this sacrament. We just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know if you have not seen uh, the Sheriff Grady Judd, you can see the service on uh, YouTube and go to Lord's Church, Lake Henry. Please stand with me if you can. And listen to the words for this beautiful song. you go out and work for him even though you might have a no fish day have faith amen, amen. just join hands and sing god is so good smiling. <laughs>